Freaky Friday Monsters. Thanks for tuning in for another episode of the Murder Murder News podcast, which also serves a weekly meeting for our very own true crime cult. That's right. We started a cult. But not to worry, you've landed in the cult with all of the sing-alongs and none of the siren gas. Grab a flower crown, take a seat around the fire as we dig into another tale of murder. In case you're just finding us now, allow us to introduce ourselves. I'm Aurora, the real housewife of true crime, and I'm here with your favorite true crime pixie, Angelina. How's your week going? Pretty great. Uh, Spring's in full swing, or maybe we skipped it, and uh, I'm digging the sunshine. I've got uh, plants uh, sprouting out. uh, My cats are begging to uh, go out and run around so I can be my next level crazy cat lady uh, (laughs) with cats on leashes or in strollers, and uh, I'm I'm fully into it. (laughs) I love cats on leashes. Please make that happen. (laughs) Oh, I will. I can take some pics, I guess. Like, Dolly's so eager, so... I love that. (laughs) (laughs) How about you? Um, You know, I am just living my best life right now. My uh, birthday is this week. It will have just passed by the time. Yeah, by the time this this plays, it'll be yesterday. So (laughs) it's a a special week, a freaky Friday, (laughs) and then Aurora's birthday, and uh, just, you know, better times ahead. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Feel it. So just because you tune into our show week after week, we do consider you all to be honorary monsters. But if you'd like to officially join the MMN commune, you could do so on Patreon. Just head over to patreon.com slash murdermurdernews and pledge just a few bucks a month to get unlimited access to our monthly Patreon-exclusive episodes. Plus, we'll give you an official title like Deacon or Grandmaster of Goats, and we'll name one of our adorable baby goats in your honor. Let's kick things off with a look at some of the true crime stories that have been making headlines this week. 47-year-old Sean Williams was just 24 years old when he was wrongfully accused of murdering a neighbor, Marvin Mason, in 1994. Sean spent 24 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. He was freed in 2018 after a witness came forward stating she was coerced into identifying Sean as the assailant by a now-retired NYPD detective. The witness has stated that detectives visited her house several times and threatened to arrest her son if she didn't name Sean as a suspect. Sean has now been rewarded a $10 million settlement by the city of New York. Sean has said, quote, no amount of money can give me back the years they took from me, but I'm going to keep rebuilding my life and looking ahead to a brighter future. Well, we have a heartbreaking update about a missing person, 24-year-old Chelsea Poorman. And some of you may recall having seen our TikTok about Chelsea, who's been missing from Vancouver, British Columbia, since September 6, 2020. And she disappeared under very suspicious circumstances. That night, she had dinner with her sister and then went to a friend's apartment. She left that apartment at Granville and Davy in downtown Vancouver around midnight, and her sister spoke to her around 1 a.m. when Chelsea said she was with her new bae. So unfortunately, um, you know, she did go missing at that point. No one has heard from her since. Um, And unfortunately, just this last weekend, her remains were located at a vacant $7 million home in Shaughnessy. And this is really suspicious, but the RCMP did not seem to agree with that and said there is no evidence of foul play. And we do want to mention that Chelsea is Indigenous and far too many Indigenous women come up missing in Canada and the U.S. only to be found later with their deaths being ruled accidental after very little investigation. And the deal is with a lot of these are the women are very young like Chelsea. When they um, do tests, there's no evidence of drug or alcohol issues or anything in their health that could have caused this death. So why they're rolling these incidents as accidental is just like clearly racism. It gets very problematic. So we've been in touch with Chelsea's family. And of course, they also have questions like, how did Chelsea end up there? Why wasn't her phone with her? How did she die? Why wasn't she found sooner? And why isn't there an investigation still ongoing? And why are they closing Mm -hmm. this out? So we're going to continue to follow Chelsea's case and see what we can all do as a community to encourage the RCMP to keep her case open. And we are definitely open to suggestions, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, like if calling them helps or like whatever you all think like might be something useful we could do to contribute to this and try to keep her case alive. 
Yeah, there's got to be some way that we can send a message that, you know, um, we're not going to let this go and we're not going to let things like this keep, you know, go over and over and over again because uh, it's it's ridiculous just thinking about the details of this case. Like, why would Chelsea wind up in a vacant $7 million home? Right. Um, and why would she accidentally die there? Or, you know, like, there's just no possible explanation for that turning out that way after she told her sister she was with a a bay or whatever. And then, right. you know, it, it turns into this. And this person is not under suspicion. <laughs> they don't right. look into who this guy is or, you know, like very, very concerning. Absolutely. And like young women don't just lay down and die like at abandoned right. houses. Like that's just yeah. not something that happens. Like there's no. got to be a cause of death. And um, because her remains have been there for uh, two years now, police have said it would be impossible to determine her cause of death. But like, I feel hmm. like we can get closer. Like, who was she with? Like, what were they doing yeah. that night when they last saw her? I feel like we can yeah. get a lot closer, even if we can't determine from her remains, like a clear cause of death at this point in time. Mm -hmm. There must be some things left to investigate there. You know, For there's sure. a lot of things like older cold cases where they find new info or test uh, evidence and f figure it out. You know, this isn't that old. It should be doable. Yeah. And, um, you know, there was a very interesting TikTok posted about Chelsea's case. And this was forwarded to us by a friend of Chelsea's family who has also forwarded it to her family. So it's a woman that knows Chelsea and... Um, she believes, has reason to believe that Chelsea was trafficked and that her family could have been involved. Um, mm. She said repeatedly in this video that she believes her family's involved um, wow. and that she believes that RCMP is helping cover it up for them. Wow. And um, I have not been able to validate this. I'm bringing it up because the TikTok seems like it's quite uh, popular. Uh, we did yeah. reach out to this person and she liked our um, a request to speak with her. She hasn't followed up beyond that, but we're going to see if we can um, see if it seems like this is a valid claim or, yeah. you know, what Dig might into be this going a little on more, there. Maybe. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So we'll report back on that. Definitely. We'll be right back after a quick commercial break from one of our fellow Darkass podcasts. Hello. And welcome to the jury room. I'm your host, Kevin, and I will be covering anything true crime, from serial killers to cold cases and everything in between. The jury room podcast is available on most major podcasting platforms. Don't forget to like, subscribe, follow anywhere you can. Stay safe and thanks for listening. And we're back. Before we dig in, we want to offer a quick disclaimer. Though we joke about forming a true crime cult, that is not to diminish the severity of actual cult activity. And we want you to know that we take the cases we're discussing very seriously. We want to deliver each story with the utmost respect to victims and anyone involved. If you feel we've missed the mark, you don't like our tone, or if you notice we've gotten any details wrong, let us know with a quick email to murdermurdernews at gmail.com and we'll make it right. Some specific trigger warnings for this episode include a mention of homophobia and graphic descriptions of violence. So if either of those are particularly sensitive subjects for you, you may want to skip this one and listen to one of our other episodes instead. Today in True Crime History marks the 34th anniversary of the murder of Rebecca White and the attack of Claudia Brenner while hiking the Appalachian Trail. Rebecca and Claudia were partners who had met up for a backpacking weekend to finally spend some romantic time together while keeping up a long distance relationship as they were both in graduate programs. That romantic outing turned deadly when a fugitive wandering through the woods became enraged after seeing the two women being intimate. The case pushed Claudia, who survived five gunshot wounds and an extraordinary hike to safety, into a life of activism when her attacker attempted to use the gay panic defense at his trial, essentially claiming temporary insanity at the sight of two women sharing what should have been a private moment. Sorry, I have to stop you right there because I need to know the gay panic defense is a real thing. 
Um, it's a nickname. Okay. Well, I mean, either way, it's ridiculous that exists. It's like they get an out. It's like, oh, you killed a gay person. Oh, but you're a bigot. Okay. You're, <laughs> you're off the hook then, you know, like what? Yeah. Fortunately, like it's more of a nickname than a real thing that this attorney tried mm -hmm. to use and, uh, we'll get to it, but fortunately did okay. not lie. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yikes though. So just a quick note to mention that the events that took place also happened to be on Friday the 13th, that May of 1988. And um, that might seem kind of like a little exploitative to mention a Friday the 13th murder, like mm. depending on, you know, like your views on this. But like we mentioned that because Claudia has mentioned this eerie observation herself about the day of mm. the attack. And of course, today happens to be another Friday the 13th in May. Our sources for today include a book written by Claudia Brenner, Eight Bullets, One Woman's Story of Surviving Anti-Gay Violence, a documentary by Claudia called In the Hollow, an interview with Claudia on BBC, also Wikipedia, and more. For a full list of sources, check out our show notes. Let's start with a little Appalachian Trail history. The trail is about 2,200 miles or 3,500 kilometers long and crosses 14 states. The idea for the trail was proposed in 1921 by Benton McKay, who dreamed of a concept of self-owning community camps. These camps would be reliant on their own agriculture for people who appreciated authentic mountain living. Kind of sounds like a cult, but we're not against it. The earliest state of the trail was completed in 1937 with changes and updates made over the years. It's managed by multiple partnerships, including the National Park Service, United States Forest Service, and the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. Honestly, when we think of hiking and the Appalachian Trail, we kind of think about creeps in the woods and murders. But according to the only and not necessarily reliable source that we could find, there have only been 13 recorded murders along the trail to date. The first murder documented was in 1974. But let's come back to our story about Rebecca and Claudia. Rebecca White was a 28-year-old grad student working on her master's in business administration at Virginia Tech. Her mother was Puerto Rican and her father was Iranian and Western European. She was smart, engaging, worldly, and beautiful. Claudia Brenner started as a grad student in architecture in 1985 at Virginia Tech after graduating from Cornell. She had just moved to Blacksburg, Virginia from Ithaca, New York, and was in the process of ending a relationship with a woman she had been dating for nine years, Anne. She was trying to make friends in her new town and started attending women's group meetings, talking about feminism, and seeking out other lesbians at the school. Rebecca had joined the same women's group, and the two women were casually acquainted. Claudia immediately found her attractive, but Rebecca was living with a man in a heterosexual relationship, so she didn't consider the potential of dating her, but the two remained casual friends for over a year. Claudia said she may have missed signals that Rebecca was sending her all along. Rebecca once sent her a postcard from South Africa while on a trip. At some point, Claudia heard a rumor that Rebecca and her boyfriend had broken up, and it felt like maybe their friendship was turning a little flirty. Claudia had been out for a while, though, and was hesitant to begin a relationship with someone who was still figuring things out. She said in her book, she, quote, did not want to get caught up in the often sticky web of a straight woman coming out. They both found out they had crushes on each other through a mutual friend, and eventually the two started dating. They kept things low pressure in the beginning because Claudia returned to Ithaca for the summer and then went on to Israel for a fellowship. The two struggled to find their footing as Claudia was fully out, but Rebecca had not been quite ready and had dated a man while Claudia was in Israel. Claudia was initially hurt to learn this, but the two decided to make things work. They were both focused on figuring out how to find a place Rebecca could go to school and Claudia could pursue her career. They were looking at schools on the West Coast and East Coast, but it looked like they finally found a plan that worked for both of them. In April of 1988, Rebecca sent Claudia a postcard saying, quote, we've ripped out a few thorny weeds and the flowers we planted last summer are blooming again. A couple of weeks after the very romantic postcard, they planned a backpacking trip together so they could finally spend some time together. Rebecca was very outdoorsy, loved backpacking and hiking, and was experienced in all things camping. Because the two of them had been in a long-distance relationship, the weekends were important to them. 
This particular weekend was a big deal because it was the end of the semester for Rebecca. With her upcoming graduation, the two of them would have a chance to finalize their plans as a couple and daydream about their futures together. They decided to meet up at Michaud State Park in Fayetteville, Pennsylvania, because it was halfway between Ithaca, New York and Blacksburg, Virginia, where the two women were living. Rebecca was especially excited to meet her because the Appalachian Trail runs through the park and she was a big fan of the Appalachian Trail or the AT as she liked to call it and many other hikers at that trail. <laughs> Both Claudia and Rebecca left their homes on Thursday, May 12th and drove towards the park agreeing on a time to meet. Strangely, they both had car trouble on the drive down. Claudia's car kept overheating and she kept having to pull over and run the heater in hopes of cooling it down. The weather was already getting warm, so she said the drive was boiling the whole day. Rebecca also had car trouble and at one point she couldn't get her car to start and was worried she wouldn't be able to meet up. Her car did finally start and the two met around 5 p.m. on May 12th and parked their cars on Dead Woman's Hollow Road. The name didn't strike them as odd or spooky at the time, but Claudia later learned the road is allegedly named this because a woman was bitten by a rattlesnake in 1917 and it took three days to find her. A friend of Rebecca's had given her a topographical map of the park, which they were excited to have in a time before cell phones and such, and Rebecca was good with maps. They parked Claudia's truck nearby and left a note on it saying they were on the Appalachian Trail and would be back. They sat in Rebecca's car, and together they looked at the map, coming up with a plan of where to go. Their plan for the weekend was to hike a little that day, set up camp, hike more on Friday, and then head back to their car on Saturday so they could drive to D.C. for Rebecca's sister's birthday. They would then come back to the park on Sunday for a little more camping time and wrap it up to part ways on Monday. They started walking south on the Appalachian Trail around 6 p.m. with their backpacks for camping. They walked past an area called Birch Run Shelters across a creek where Claudia was a little nervous to walk because she had a hard time with her balance and was worried about falling into the cold water or embarrassing herself in front of Rebecca. As they walked, Rebecca talked about her love of the AT and a little bit about the history of the trail and how it was federal land, but sometimes moved because it was just on people's private property. They got to the campsite and it was pretty big and according to Claudia, it looked kind of like a place Boy Scouts would stay. It wasn't anything glamorous with just a lean-to, fire pit, and an outhouse. Still, it was quiet and seemed like a good place for them to stay for the night. They set up their tent and Claudia was excited because they had sleeping bags that zipped together. Rebecca had camped with an ex-boyfriend and he had a left-handed sleeping bag that zipped together with her right-handed bag. Claudia didn't realize her sleeping bag was also left-handed, so they fit together too, which seemed like such a great metaphor for the weekend. There was still plenty of light and no one else was at the campground. They made dinner, but Rebecca didn't want to make a fire because she believed real campers used portable stoves and not fires. They pretty much just ate dinner and went to sleep not long after it was dark. They woke up a bit late the next day, considering they were camping, and Claudia left the tent first. They washed together in a stream, then headed back to camp where Claudia heated water for coffee and breakfast. They were alone and just sort of running around naked, enjoying one of the few times they could be together. Rebecca liked to stay at campsites because there were log books for people to sign, and she liked reading the stories of others who had been there. She went to get the log book from the lean-to to bring back to their campsite to read at breakfast, and that's when she ran into 21-year-old Stephen Roy Carr. Rebecca had been totally naked except for her tennis shoes since she thought they were alone, and she was, of course, a little bit self-conscious. She said something like, I'm really embarrassed. I thought we were alone. He told Rebecca that he had arrived late the night before and hadn't seen the girls and also thought no one else was there, but Rebecca didn't quite believe him. He asked her for a cigarette, and she said she didn't have any. She said when he was talking to her, she could see that he had a heart on. Rebecca went back to Claudia and told her to get dressed because they weren't alone. She described the guy as kind of a creep and said he was the kind of guy who would come into the woods because he had nothing to do and lay around doing crossword puzzles. They weren't afraid of him and didn't sense anything was wrong, just that he was a little weird. Mostly, they were just annoyed because they wanted space and didn't want some creepy guy around their perfect little paradise. Their original plan was to leave their tent in this spot and go out hiking without their backpacks and then stay the night here again. 
They agreed to pack up and move on, not because they were worried, but because they didn't know if Stephen would be staying there again or if someone might show up since they were so close to the road. They got dressed, Claudia in shorts and Rebecca in long pants. They ate oatmeal, Claudia made, though Rebecca didn't like oatmeal and loaded hers with raisins to try to mask it. They took their time cleaning up their campsite, chatting, cleaning their dishes and food, and then packed to head out. Claudia saw Stephen sitting in the lean-to in gray sweatpants, just sitting there. They all said, see you later to each other, and the girls were off. 30 minutes later, Rebecca and Claudia stopped to look at a map and were trying to figure out which way to approach a loop trail. Claudia remembered Rebecca being very affectionate and maybe a little needy. Looking back, Claudia now wonders if some part of Rebecca's spirit already knew and was seeking closure. Claudia teased her about not getting enough kisses, and the two were playful with each other while they tried to figure out their next path. Claudia was putting the map back in Rebecca's backpack when she heard a sneering voice say, you're lost already. Stephen was about 30 feet behind them. They were a little surprised and a little uncomfortable to see him again, especially since that must have meant he left camp not long after them, following the same path. He had a 22 caliber rifle across his shoulders, with his hand casually resting on top of it. This was the first time they noticed he had a gun. Claudia answered his taunting of whether they were lost, saying, no, are you? With that, they went one direction and he went another. The girls felt unsettled and were looking over their shoulders for a while and talked about what he might be up to. They suggested that he was a hunter, so it didn't seem unusual to them that he had a gun, but at the same time, it wasn't hunting season. Claudia suggested that maybe he was heading to work a shift later in the day at a factory. They kept looking over their shoulders to make sure they weren't being followed, but it seemed like there was no one behind them. They went on the loop trail to look at some beautiful vistas. It was a pretty steep, difficult climb that took most of the day. They talked about setting up camp when they got to the top of the ridge, but it was too rocky. It was a hard climb, and Claudia had gotten lightheaded, so they stopped a bit to rest, to kiss, and to talk about the weird guy. The trail brought them to a stream, and after quite a bit of surveying the area, they eventually ended up at a remote wooded campsite around 3.30 or 4 in the afternoon. It was a warm spring day and the sun was still shining. There was a little gurgling stream nearby and the spot was pretty idyllic. Claudia remembers saying, we're off the trail, there's no way he can find us. They still had plenty of time before nightfall with not a lot to do. They made a plan to make some iced tea and dinner a little later. They boiled some water for the tea and Rebecca had a sore throat so they ended up making high vitamin C tea. They cooled the tea by putting the canteen in the cold stream. After their teas, they laid out their tent and tent fly on a patch of moss by the stream and were making out in the tent to keep the bugs off them. Rebecca told Claudia to take off her shorts and she said they didn't have sex, but they were just rolling around and being playful, chatting, giggling. Claudia remembers saying, do you want to set up the tent and get serious about this? And Rebecca said, no, let's stay out here. Suddenly, Claudia heard an explosion and then felt like her arm had exploded. The way she described it, her mind thought the world had exploded, and she couldn't understand how the world could just explode. The next thing she knew, the green tarp was red with blood. In that instant, her mind went to natural disasters, as that's the only way she could make sense of what was happening. She thought of earthquakes and volcanoes, but remembered thinking volcanoes didn't make you bleed. Rebecca realized Claudia had been shot right away and asked where she had been hit. In the next 20 to 30 seconds, Claudia was hit twice more, and sometime in the chaos, one of them said, he came back. Claudia started screaming, enough, and stop. Then she was shot in the neck and cheek. As the shots continued to hit Claudia, Rebecca told her to get down on the ground. Rebecca hadn't been shot because Claudia was blocking the path. Even being down on the ground, Claudia was hit on top of the head, and Rebecca realized that wouldn't work and told her to run behind the tree. Claudia ran first and made it without being hit again. But as Rebecca turned to run behind the tree, she was shot two times, once in her head and once in her back. They made it behind the tree, and Claudia panicked, just kept asking, what are we going to do? In a frantic loop, Rebecca said, stop the bleeding. 
Claudia has talked about how her brain couldn't make sense of what was happening during the entire attack. And if it weren't for Rebecca's commands, get down, get behind the tree, stop the bleeding, she would be dead. She said that the last lucid thing Rebecca said was, stop the bleeding. Claudia believes Rebecca's spirit left her after that, and she knew she was dying and began to shut down, relinquishing her control over their survival. At this point, Claudia's brain snapped into gear, and she took over where Rebecca no longer could. She realized she was bleeding heavily from her neck, and their backpacks were far away. Without thinking that Stephen could have a clearer shot of her, Claudia darted out to get their backpacks and found towels and clothes. She brought them back to the tree and wrapped the towel tightly around her neck. She held a t-shirt against Rebecca's neck to stop the bleeding. Rebecca said her back really hurt, but there wasn't much blood. Once Claudia had stopped the bleeding in her neck, she felt like she would live. She convinced herself Stephen had shot her with a BB gun and told herself she would survive. She also knew they had to get out of there and got both of their shoes and sat Rebecca's down next to her. Rebecca was feeling around the ground for her shoes, and Claudia realized she couldn't see where her shoes were, which she couldn't make sense of at the time. Rebecca couldn't put on her shoes, so Claudia put them on for her. Claudia was trying to pump Rebecca up, saying, come on, we've got to go, over and over again, but Rebecca wasn't responding. Claudia worked on a plan of what to do next. She'd been shot five times, and Rebecca was in bad shape. They were four miles, or about 6.5 kilometers, from the road, and they didn't know where Stephen was or if he would come after them again. Claudia tried to pick Rebecca up a few times, but every time, she collapsed. At one point, Rebecca managed to attempt to stand up, but couldn't make it. She just said, it really hurts a lot. Claudia thought about trying to cut the bullet out of Rebecca's back, but she wasn't quite sure how and worried that removing the bullet would increase her likelihood of bleeding out. She decided the best plan was to leave Rebecca and go off on her own to get help. Claudia encouraged Rebecca to lie down, and realizing she had to leave Rebecca was the hardest thing she had to do. Rebecca seemed to want her to stay and lay down with her, as though they could die there together like Romeo and Juliet. Claudia explained that she had to go get help and then fussed over trying to find her wallet in case she needed money. She looked around the campsite and found the map and a flashlight, knowing it would get dark soon. It was starting to get chilly, so before leaving, Claudia brought over both the sleeping bags and put them on top of Rebecca. She told Rebecca she was leaving to get help, but Rebecca's breathing had slowed and she wasn't talking at this point. Claudia regrets not saying an official goodbye. Oh, that's so sad. I know. It's like you want to be hopeful and be like, I shouldn't have to say a last goodbye because we're going to be fine. I know, um, and I'm sure that's what part of it was for her, just like holding on to hope. Definitely. Claudia was being protected by adrenaline at this point and had lost track of her own injuries. Something took over and she just started walking. It was a rough climb out of the campsite and it was early spring, so no one had done any trail maintenance at this point. She found the main trail and then it eventually turned into more of a four-wheel drive access road. Claudia was tempted to run, but a voice in her head kept telling her to just walk and she kept going. There was no way she could hurry and live. She was having trouble breathing with the blood in her mouth, and it felt like air was coming in from the wrong places, from the wound in her neck. The entire time, Claudia was worried she would run into Stephen and his gun again, and she kept stopping to look around and make sure she was truly alone. Three hours later, Claudia got to a state forest road and heard a car approaching. She took the white towel from her neck, now stained blood red, and waved it for the car to slow down. The car didn't stop. She kept walking along the State Forest Road and saw a few houses along the way tucked into the woods. She considered breaking into one to try to find a phone, but she was worried one of those houses could be Stephen's or that Stephen would be waiting inside. That must be like so bad in survival cases to like just never know like where the right place is to go for help. Like what if they've like or who you can trust? Yeah, yeah. Especially if you really felt safe and alone in the beginning, and then you found out you were wrong. Like you would uh, not trust your judgment after that. Be like, especially having lost blood and like whatever. Yeah, I just can't imagine. The sound of cars could be heard in the distance, and she knew she was coming up in a busier stretch of road. 
It was after dark and she decided she couldn't walk any further and she would just wait for a car to come to her. Right away, she saw headlights down the road and stepped into the middle of the street to make big circles in the dark with her flashlights. As the car approached, she held her ground, making sure they did not drive past her. Two teenage boys pulled over. She yelled, you must help me, I've been shot. The car started to turn around and she yelled, where are you going? The boys said they were just turning the car around so she could get in, and the boy in the passenger seat got out so Claudia could ride in the front. Claudia, worried she might not make it, kept repeating her name, the name of the trail, and that her friend, Rebecca White, was shot and needed help. She made the boys repeat it back to her just to be sure. They took her to the closest town, 15 minutes away, Shippensburg, Pennsylvania. It was the closest place with a small police slash fire station. Once at the station, Claudia told them Rebecca had been shot and was injured badly and kept insisting, we have to go find her. At this point, the pain finally started to settle in for Claudia. She couldn't swallow, her neck hurt, her ear hurt, and her arm was on fire. Every time she tried to speak, her throat would gurgle with blood. She told the police Rebecca was at the Rocky Knob Trail and drew a circle of her location on the map. A search party set out for Rebecca immediately, and Claudia was relieved when an officer came back to verify that her friend was Rebecca, not Becky, so he could call for her. Claudia assumed she would just be stitched up on the spot and go back out looking for Rebecca, but her injuries were obviously far too serious. Claudia was transferred to a nearby hospital by ambulance and then finally to a trauma center by helicopter. When she realized her injuries were more extensive than she had known and that she would need surgery, she told the nurse if they found Rebecca was dead, she did not want to know until after her surgery. When Claudia woke from surgery, her friends and family had already been notified about the attack and rushed to join her in the hospital. Her ex, Anne, who had remained a close friend, was there beside her and was the one who told her the news. The search party had located Rebecca late that night on Friday the 13th, close to where Claudia had marked the spot on the map, but Rebecca hadn't survived. In fact, Rebecca's injuries had been so severe, doctors assured her that there was nothing they could have done for her, even if she would have been shot directly on their operating table. The bullet had gone through her back and shattered her liver. Oh my God. Yeah. Stephen had shot at Claudia and Rebecca eight times. He hit Claudia five times, Rebecca twice, and missed with the eighth shot. Claudia was in the hospital for 10 days, and an FBI sketch artist was brought in to get a description of the attacker. Police had five suspects in mind, but after Claudia's sketch, they narrowed it down to just one suspect, Stephen Roy Carr. At this point, over 200 people living in the area had been interviewed as potential witnesses, and a $500 reward had been issued for information leading to an arrest of the murderer. Stephen was known to be living in the woods and would sometimes stay with a few acquaintances around the area. It was believed he was in the area at the time, and he had served a sentence in a prison in Florida and was known as being a hunter. One family in Shippensburg said Stephen had shown up at their home late on May 13th and had told their son he had done a terrible thing. He had hunted birds with their son, and some shell casings were found where Stephen had been hunting, matched the casings found at the scene of the attack. On May 23rd, the search for Stephen began, deploying 14 horses, five teams of dogs, and trained search teams. The composite sketch of Stephen was released to the media and was all over the news. It turns out he had been hiding out with a Mennonite family. After he left the home of the family he had been staying with in Shippensburg, he found a shallow metal tub and used it to float down a creek for two days until he found the Mennonite community. What the heck? It's just... So unreal. Very, very strange. Mm. So once he got there, he made up a story about being down in his luck to the woman that found him and asked if she would let him stay in her barn for a couple days while he recovered. The Mennonites didn't own TVs, so they did not see all the broadcasts about his composite and had no idea about the murder. However, there was one lesser pious member of the community that did have a TV and recognized <laughs> Stephen when he went to church with the family he was staying with. Such good luck. <laughs> yes. The man told a preacher on May 24th, that preacher called the police. A whole SWAT team descended on the Mennonite family's pasture and arrested Stephen Roy Carr. Wow. 
Stephen waived his right to a jury trial in exchange for an agreement by the prosecution not to seek the death penalty. The defense argued that he had shot Rebecca and Claudia in the heat of passion caused by the provocation of their nude homosexual lovemaking. That's called provocation? Yeah. <laughs> nope. Yes. <laughs> He offered a history of constant rejection by women, including his mother, who may have been involved in a lesbian relationship, sexual abuse while in prison in Florida, the inability to hold a job, no idea what that has to do with this. And he was (laughs) sexually abused as a child, which as a side note is pedophilia, not homophobia. Right. The sight of them caused Stephen inexplicable rage. This defense did not hold up thankfully. And the judge found Stephen guilty and sentenced him to life without the possibility of parole, which seemed like an appropriate sentence to Claudia. We do want to note that Stephen was not charged with a hate crime, which would have been very appropriate, but it looks as though there wasn't a law including sexual orientation as a hate crime in Pennsylvania until 2002, though we struggled to find a credible source for this information. Claudia didn't want to, but felt as though she had to live a life of activism after her attack. She moved back to Ithaca and wrote her book, Eight Bullets, One Woman's Story of Surviving Anti-Gay Violence, which was released in 1995. And if you're a fan of I Survived, we highly recommend tracking it down because it's just so harrowing to hear the whole story in Claudia's words. She went on to fight for anti-hate laws, including the Hate Crimes Statistic Act of 1990, signed by George Bush. She was there for the signing. It was the first federal law to mention sexual orientation. In 2015, she released a short documentary called In the Hollow about the attack, which is listed in our show notes. In that documentary, Claudia returned to the hollow where she was shot five times for the first time since 1988. It's very moving. Very, very moving. It was incredibly hard for her to do that. It's really beautiful. Mm, Cannot imagine. Yeah. Claudia now works as an architect in Ithaca. When asked about her grieving, she said she had often wondered what would have happened if her truck had just died on the way down to meet Rebecca and they wouldn't have been able to meet on the trail that weekend. Though she sometimes wishes she could have traded Stephen's life for Rebecca's, this stage of grieving she's in doesn't contain that kind of bargaining for her anymore. She has said she didn't want Stephen to extinguish life from her or capacity to love, to have a family and relationships. And she also didn't want the shooting to change her career path. She is still an activist, but she has chosen to live her life. Incredible. I can't imagine going through that and like just carrying on, you know, like that's so, she put herself through a lot of hard things just to get the story out there, which is so amazing. And uh, it's so great that she did that because, I mean, we've got to fight for these things. Those laws didn't exist that included sexual orientation as a hate crime until so, so long after, you know, generations of hate crimes had been going on, you know? (laughs) I I was actually uh, quite shocked to learn that, that it wasn't until 2002 and like many states, I think California Um, was the first to adopt it. And it wasn't long before that. I think it was in the 90s. So that was quite shocking for me. Wow. Yeah. And this guy, um, he just seems like a classic incel prior to um, incels being labeled (laughs) as existing, I guess, you know? Yeah. That Mm -hmm. thought definitely occurred to me while I was reading about his you know, yeah, logic or lack thereof, like behind this. It's like, so you're disgruntled because women yeah. don't like you and you hate lesbians because of this enough and to kill you them. Can't like, keep what? a job because of lesbians. Yeah. Like, what? And it's like, if your mother was a lesbian, I mean, that should make you appreciate and accept lesbians more and not I would think hate so. them I would more. That's so. very, yeah. very confusing and not, not cool, obviously. <laughs> but, uh, wow. Very confusing, but just really incredible story. Like I'm, you know, I'm a huge fan. My favorite TV show of all time is I Survived. And I was like really hoping Claudia had been on an episode because I wanted to like really get to hear her speak about it. And she unfortunately has not been on I Survived, um, but she Mm -hmm. has written the book, which is just incredible. It's a great read. Um, The BBC interview is great. It's rather short. It's only like a 15 minute Mm -hmm. segment. So you're not getting full details about her story, but the book is really good. And um, 
we didn't quite have time to reach out to Claudia before uh, this episode, but I do want to reach out to her and see if we can get her on the show at some time in the future because yeah. I just want to meet her so badly. Like, I think yeah. she's incredible. Very inspiring for sure. Yeah. Like, I can't imagine pulling something like that off and surviving and then, like, making, I don't know, the, the right kind of, um, like, just trying to find some closure so that she could carry on with her life and realizing that that's important and that, you know, there's other things she has to offer out there that she shouldn't just shut down and, uh, you know, be defeated by this. And I just, I think I would definitely be defeated. So just, uh, it does not wow. take much to defeat me. So yes, no, I'm always no. <laughs> very neither. impressed by survival stories. It's like, I'm wow, like, someone you... was rude to me. Like, forget yeah. this whole day. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I did yeah. not have the ingredients for my smoothie for breakfast this morning. I'm not getting out of bed. Like, it's, <laughs> the slightest inconvenience can just like totally wipe yeah. out my day. Side note, though, something that I don't think I've heard in um, a murder story before um, was the whole Mennonite angle. Apparently, um, you know, hiding out with Mennonites is a, a good way to get away with shit. Like, I mean, obviously it backfired because there is somebody that has a TV in the right. group, but uh, chances were, I guess, he would have bought himself a lot of time with that, which uh, I wouldn't have thought of. Like, there's probably I, some people out here that are not connected yeah. to the world that I can go hide with. <laughs> like, Yeah. I, I mean, it was apparently a reasonably, you know, thought out escape plan with the tub floating down the river and such. And I'm not sure so, if he knew so where strange. he had landed. Like, I don't know if it was yeah. his intent to find the Mennonite community uh, or, you know, if he just happened there. Maybe but, it just, um, yeah, you know, Also, this was in the 1980s, so it's possible mm. that there are more or less pious people with televisions. I don't know. I don't know much yeah. about well, I uh, hope. the religion. I was thinking this guy that had the television and was able to put two and two together, like, I feel like he must have been validated in his desire to own a television and been like, see, this is where I'm yeah, right. <laughs> and like the church is maybe not so on maybe the ball. television is not yeah. the devil. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Have you been watching anything cool? No, uh, I know there's a bunch of things out and like the past week, like The Staircase with Tony Collette just came out and oh, yeah. gosh, there's one other one on Hulu that I want to see that I can't think of right now, but um, things have been a little bit chaotic because I wanted mm -hmm. to get to take this whole week off for my birthday and just be like a diva <laughs> and sit out by the pool and mm -hmm. like go swimming and like go see whales and like whatever on the islands. That's and so all very I, fair. Right. And so like last mm -hmm. week I... Uh, did everything I needed to do so I could take this week off. Like I did all of my Amazing. TikTok videos and everything. So I did not have a chance for Perfect. TV, but please tell me what I should be watching because I will have some time in the next few days. <laughs> Um, yeah, we're going to need some help from the listeners for that one. Yeah. I don't have uh, anything super true crimey to mention, but I have been watching this show, The Pentaveret. Have you heard of mm, this? Uh -uh. I'm not sure if you have it on your Netflix or if it's just on the Canadian one, but it is a new uh, Mike Myers um, thing, like oh. mini series, And it's based on... Um, sort of conspiracy theories and like the Illuminati and secret uh, organizations and uh, all of this. But it's a it's a silly version, obviously, with Mike Myers playing a, a whole slew of characters. Oh, fun. And uh, it's cute. I've been enjoying. <laughs> you know, I saw something pop up on my Netflix that I thought, is that Mike Myers? Like, I haven't seen him in anything for oh, so yeah, long. It's I'm probably not sure this it's thing. So it's probably that. So I probably he looks do so have it old. online. I'll I was like, out. I started telling Louie, I'm like, probably Mike Myers is like 70 years old. Like, look how his eyes are like drooping. And he was like, he's not 70 years old. And he looked it up and he was like 58 or something. Uh -huh. And uh, then I realized that the drooping eyes were like a prosthetic that's like part of his his look for some of these characters. And I was like, it's so well done. It looks real. It looks like there's an old man hiding under there and that the young ones are fake. And I'm like, that's, I don't know, very cool stuff. Cool I makeup. I love that. <laughs> Good job, mm. makeup artist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So um, if anyone's looking for a non-true crime palette cleanser, I know everybody in the world probably already knows about this, but The Circle mm -hmm. has a new season out. And mm. uh, this is more of like a, if you're in our Facebook group and like want to chat about The Circle and the Spice Girls being on it, like let's <laughs> yes. talk about the Spice Girls. <laughs> yeah, that's something. <laughs> uh, are you interested in all that watching this? Because I would love to talk to you about it, Angelina. <laughs> um, you know, I would watch it with the Spice Girls on it just yeah. to, you know, 
know, see, I am kind of interested in the the plot of it, but I've just never checked it out yet. But now sounds like a good time. So what the heck? You can definitely check it out. I can just out start and... like randomly in the second, yeah. in the next season, right? Like, yeah, totally. Yeah. It's the fourth season and y- you don't have to have seen the prior seasons. Like you might, they might Perfect. like speed through the rules of the game a bit more than in prior seasons mm. for the fourth season, but you'll, it's- I can it, probably grasp it. I think yeah. you can handle it. <laughs> it's really good. So definitely uh, everybody, let's talk about Spice Girls. Yeah. Well, I guess that's enough murder for one week. If you need just a smidge more murder, you can always find us on the OG murdermurder.news for the latest breaking true crime news all week long. You can also find us on Instagram at Murder Murder News, on Twitter at mm, Murder News, mm. on TikTok at Murder Murder News, and on Facebook. You can find us just by searching for Murder Murder News. And when you search Murder Murder News on Facebook, you will also see our group pop up. You want to hit that join button to stay in the loop about any upcoming events we may have and to join our virtual book club. We're currently reading The Thursday Murder Club by Richard Osman. We will meet on Zoom to discuss it on the last Sunday of this month. and We hope to see you all there. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts if you're enjoying the show. And don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform to make sure you never miss an episode. Have a great week. Bye, friends. Bye.